Um, I will be discussing um, four or five abstracts, depending on the time. Uh, the nutshell of the first abstract is uh, basically that the addition of a VEGF inhibitor, bevacizumab, to chemotherapy in patients with metastatic squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck uh, improves overall survival, but the improvement is not statistically significant. And what that does basically is a hypothesis generating that we should be encouraged to uh, investigate uh, the addition, the use of VEGF inhibitors like bevacizumab in combination with uh, checkpoint inhibitors in the treatment of metastatic squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. And uh, the second abstract I will be discussing has to do with nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And the study was actually conducted in Hong Kong. And um, uh, for the most part, uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma in, in the Orient is considered endemic because these patients are EBV or Epstein Barr virus positive uh, 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 diseases. And what the, the investigators uh, looked into was whether the addition of additional chemotherapy, i.e., adjuvant chemotherapy, will improve survival or disease-free survival or local control in patients who are EBV positive after initial radiation therapy or chemoradiation therapy. And what they found were basically two, two, uh, uh, the, the two points. One, they found out that addition of chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting to patients who are EBV positive after initial chemoradiation therapy did not improve survival. And what they confirmed was that positive EBV following chemoradiation therapy was detrimental to survival. So that was the second finding. Now, here in the Western world, most of our uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the nasopharynx are EBV negative. So the, our standard of care is a little different here in the, in the Western world. Uh, we use uh, initial chemoradiation therapy followed by adju adjuvant chemotherapy. Whereas in the East, in China, in Hong Kong, Taiwan, those places where they have EBV endemic nasopharyngeal carcinoma, their standard of care is a chemoradiation therapy with no benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. And the third abstract I will be discussing is actually a study that came from uh, India. And uh, they were comparing the outcome uh, between weekly cisplatin versus every three-week cisplatin concurrently with radiation therapy in patients with locally advanced squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. Um, basically, they used a 30 milligram per meter square uh, weekly cisplatin and found out that those patients who received three weekly high dose cisplatin concurrently with radiation therapy did a lot better in terms of disease free survival, progression free survival, and response compared to patients who receive weekly 30 milligram uh, 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 per meter square cisplatin. Uh, which is kind of, uh, you know, interesting in the sense that here in the United States, for although a lot of us use weekly cisplatin, we do not use 30 milligrams per meter square. Here in the United States, we use 40 milligrams cisplatin per meter square. And so we do not know whether 40 milligram uh, per meter square concurrently with radiation therapy is actually better than uh, 100 milligram per meter square every three weeks concurrently with radiation therapy. Uh, that is currently being looked into by a Japanese study, but what we do know is that 30 milligram per meter square weekly 
concurrently with radiation therapy is actually sub-therapeutic. And here in the United States, there are two strategies that we use. We use 100 milligram per meter square cisplatin concurrently with radiation therapy. Or some of us use 40 milligram per meter square of cisplatin every week concurrently with radiation therapy. And this is the standard that we use here in the United States. And uh, the um, fourth abstract I'll be discussing is, is um, uh, on um, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. Now, most of the very aggressive, invasive cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma occur in the head and neck region. So those of us who treat head and neck uh, cancers, it's not unusual to see these patients in our clinic. Now, the primary treatment for locally advanced uh, squamous, uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck is surgery. Following surgery, uh, usually the, you know, the relapse rate with surgery alone is about 40 to 50 percent. And with post-operative radiation therapy, you can actually improve uh, the relapse rate uh, by, by 20 to 30 percent. Now, what we do not know in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck, unlike what we know in mucosal squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck, where we know that addition of cisplatin to radiation therapy in the adjuvant setting improves survival. Now, in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck, we do not know whether the addition of chemotherapy to, radiation, to adjuvant radiation therapy improves survival or relapse uh, or local regional control. And that was what this study was, uh, was going to confirm for us. Now, so uh, what they found out in a nutshell was that the addition of chemotherapy to post-operative radiation therapy was of no benefit. You know, and I think that is very much hypothesis generating. This was a very large study, and probably I think, you know, the largest study of its kind in this population of patients, and I think it's practice changing to know that in the adjuvant setting, that the addition of chemotherapy to post-operative radiation therapy was of no benefit. So I think that was a great study. Now the fifth abstract is really a hypothesis generating, and um, and uh, this was an abstract, uh, really was an analysis of an old study, uh, Keynote 12, uh, which was uh, a basket trial of multiple solid tumors. Now in the cohorts, they had two cohorts of head and neck squamous cell carcinoma in the co cohort. And you know, the analysis was that you know, in Keynote 12, uh, when they analyzed all commas for response rate, the response rate varied from 18 to 20 percent. But when they dichotomized to, you know, uh, between patients who were HPV, human papilloma virus positive, versus those who were negative, they found that those who were positive had a 34 percent response rate to pembrolizumab, a checkpoint inhibitor, versus 14 percent response rate in patient, patients who were HPV negative. So that was kind of interesting because then what it did was it raised this, you know, the, 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 the interest that there may be particular molecular markers that enhance response to checkpoint inhibitors like pembrolizumab. And the, the, um, what they essentially found to make, you know, in, in a nutshell, was that indeed uh, patients uh, who were uh, HPV positive responded better. Whether you know, the HPV detection was based on immunohistochemistry for P16 or whether it was based on whole exon sequencing, that those who were, pos who were positive responded better to pembrolizumab. And those who were negative to HPV did better when the mutation load, the mutation load of the tumor microenvironment was high, they responded better to uh, pembrolizumab. The outcome of this particular study 
uh, was just hypothesis generating. Um, it really does not have any clinical utility at this time. And I think uh, you know, it's something that is of interest for us to look into in the future. Thank you. Thank you.